All right. How's it going, everybody? Uh, gonna do a little tour today, a little specialized tour. It's gonna be uh, uh, the Irish, the history of the Irish in New York. Uh, this is a, you may sound like a random topic, but one of the reasons I'm doing it is because I actually was hired to do this tour uh, back in the day. So everything's kind of close together and we're not gonna be able to go all over the freaking city, all right? I don't have a freaking Anthony Bourdain budget here, but I'm gonna show you around this area of Lower Manhattan, show you some spot, sites you might not know about and tell you a little bit of the history. It's gonna be a good time. Before we get started, how are you, Cam? Top of the morning to you. All right, that's enough. He's Irish. That's how the Irish talk. <laughs> they say top of the morning to you. Uh, all right, anyways, uh, before, we, before we start, guys, check out the Patreon, huge help. That's how I fund these things. Also, extras on there. Um, like and subscribe. I'm not gonna harp too much on these things. I'm gonna let you be the judge, baby. Don't wanna ramble. What do you think? Should we get started, Cam? Let's do it. Let's do it, let's do it, I'll say. Oh, bad. That was terrible. That was terrible. All right, let's just get started before I insult everyone. Okay, we're starting here in front of Castle Clinton. This is a where you would get the tickets to go to the Statue of Liberty. Importantly enough, uh, from 1855 to 1890, this was the main immigrant processing center in New York City. Pretty cool, huh? This is where you would come where the boat would drop you off, you get processed and go right in. This was basically Ellis Island before Ellis Island because in 1890, the federal government took over. Ah, uh, it wasn't the state or whatever anymore. The federal government started moving stuff over eventually to Ellis Island. Before this was here, it was total pandemonium. Now remember, the Irish had been coming in to New York for a little bit. They were basically the first major immigrant wave into New York City. Uh, after the War of 1812, a lot of Irish chose to come here uh, because of their uh, antagonism, because of the United States' antagonism with the British. They're like, oh, these guys are cool. They hate the Brits just like us. So they would come here. Uh, and then it started to pick up as poverty became a bigger issue. And then it really picked up in the mid-1800s with uh, Potato famine and all that, the Irish hunger, we'll talk about that in another stop, but um, before this was here, they would basically, basically park the boats wherever and just get unloaded and be completely exploited. People would come up, runners would come up and speak, you know, in the, about the, hey, you're from County Cork? Me too, oh, come on over, let me take all your luggage and leave you with nothing, all right, great. So this was actually put here as a way to kind of uh, protect the people coming in and as a way to control uh, because it was getting out of control. That, that was 1855. Before 1855, it was insane. Now, before this was here, uh, as the immigrant processing, it was actually a music venue. It was uh, all kinds of things. It was called Castle Garden. And this is actually famously where Jenny Lind, uh, the Swedish nightingale, huh? she, she had a, a big uh, residency here in 1851. I guess may, may know her name from P.T. Barnum, who brought her over, spent a lot of money to bring her over and made a killing as well. Uh, you don't know the movie, uh, the, the Showman. The what's the movie? You know what I'm talking about? Greatest Showman. Yeah, the Greatest Showman. I actually never seen the movie, but I do know that uh, P.T. Barnum was played by Hugh Jackman. Pretty, uh, pretty, pretty liberal casting. Uh, uh, P.T. Barnum wasn't exactly the most handsome man. Um, I guess if they ever, if that casting director ever makes a makes a biopic of me, I guess he'll pick, I don't know, Denzel Washington uh, based on that logic. But. Uh, Anyways, Jenny Lind, prelate here, 18, like I said, 1855, became the main processing center. Now I was saying this was Ellis Island before Ellis Island. Ellis Island, obviously, a very important uh, immigrant processing center. I would take you over there, but uh, getting a permit to go over there is a huge pain in the ass. So you get this, baby, us standing here in front of the Castle Clinton. Now keep in mind, by 1855, a third of New York City was Irish. A third. That's crazy. Uh, so it grew pretty quickly. So by 1860, New York City was already one of the most populous cities in the world, one of the four most populated. But unlike the other three, it was the one that owed its population to immigration. That's kind of cool. All the other big cities in the world weren't as, I guess, diverse. They were more homogenous. And New York City from that time even was already kind of this bastion of uh, diversity and, uh, and difference. Embrace the difference, baby. Um, anyways, I'm rambling. It's cold. Uh, let's keep it moving. Mm -hmm. 
there was one event that you'll always hear people talk about when it comes to Irish immigration, and that is the uh, Irish potato famine or the Irish hunger. Uh, so this basically began in 1845 uh, and lasted throughout the 1840s and the 1850s, and it was basically the potato crop was decimated by uh, basically this fungus that originated with uh, guano, which is like droppings, uh, that was put into the fertilizer here in the United States into the potato uh, crop, but it made its way back to Ireland, and it actually made its way to the mainland Europe as well. Two million people left Ireland. A million people were killed. The one million dead would be an equivalent of 41 million people dying in the United States. Two million people gone, that's 82 million people leaving. That's a lot, man. That's a huge, significant portion of uh, the country that left Ireland, and a lot of them came here. By 1851, the immigration levels of the Irish reached five times the pre-famine levels, uh, just to give you kind of an idea. So just imagine living over there, you know, and waking up every day, you would see like four or five bodies just strewn in the street. Uh, you know, people who died of hunger or whatever. That's gonna put a damper on your, you know, your rise and grind morning. And this behind me is actually called the Irish Hunger Memorial. You might not even know this exists. This is actually Vesey Street, basically where it meets the water here on the uh, Hudson River. But this was built in 2002 and it actually commemorates that uh, event in history. And it actually has like plants and stuff from uh, Ireland, as well as rocks from each of the 32 counties. It has the names on the county, of the counties as well on there. Pretty cool. Uh, that's right. Ireland rocks. Right, Cameron? That was your best one, yeah. That was the best one, right? Uh, Cameron's Irish. Okay, so one of the reasons why the fungus didn't spread here in uh, the U.S. as much as it did there is because of the weather. The weather in Ireland was damp and cold, and that helps spread the fungus around. As if the weather itself wasn't depressing enough, throwing a, you know, famine that kills a million people that blight had an effect in mainland Europe. It did spread there and it caused some crop shortages, but remember they weren't as reliant on the potato in places like Germany, but those food shortages did lead to the revolutions in the 1840s. For example, the failed revolution in Germany in 1848. Look at that, that also pushed Germans to come here. This is an important time to bring up that the mid 1800s also brought a lot of Germans to the United States, but those Germans were leaving a lot of them for political reasons. They weren't leaving out of the desperation that the Irish left under. So those Germans came usually a little more educated, a little, more, uh, a little better equipped, uh, so they weren't as discriminated against because of that. Whereas the Irish came over here desperate and poor and dying. Remember, this is before Castle Clinton, this is before the Immigrant Processing Center. Almost 10% of people on the ships at some points when there was like cholera outbreaks and things on these ships, this is before steamships took over the uh, immigration they were dying. So you'd come over and, you know, you were on a, you know, a boat and you're like, all right, hopefully I'm not one of the people they take out of here in a body bag, but that's what would happen. And remember, it was this mass migration and it was this famine that really made the numbers explode. Like I said, there were Irish coming before and there were Irish that came after, but this is what really turned the tide. Pretty insane that this really kind of changed the makeup of the entire city. And this is the monument to it. Pretty cool story, huh? Uh, it's a little depressing but uh, it's important history. All right, let's keep it moving. I'm freezing. And yeah, I'll zip up my coat while we walk. Let's go. All right, so it's important to note that not all the Irish came because of the potato famine. The Irish coming were, were coming before it and they came after it. Uh, I'm actually standing in uh, St. Paul's Chapel's uh, St. Paul's Chapel's graveyard, uh, and I'm standing next to the obelisk of William McNevin. This is an interesting story, but he's not actually buried here. He's actually buried in Queens, um, but he came over here uh, in the early 1800s, and he was actually a doctor. He was head of the cholera board here in New York. Cholera. Hope he washed his hands coming home from that work. So William McNevin dies in the 1840s. This obelisk was built and finished in 1866, 1865, 1866. And the reason they built it was because the Fenian Brotherhood, supposedly, was this group fighting for Irish independence, and they needed to launder money to fund the invasion of Canada. That's right. In 1866, began the Irish invasion of Canada. They were going to basically, the plan was, invade Canada, which was run by the British at the time, hold it for ransom, and then get your independence. <laughs> Didn't work out that way, unfortunately. A few years uh, a few years into the invasion, actually, 
in all fairness, like the Battle of Ridgeway was kind of at the beginning of this invasion and actually looked kind of like in the favor of the Irish, but it fell apart. Interestingly enough, it was this invasion, using a lot of former uh, Civil War veterans and stuff, that pushed Canada to become its own country a few years later. Uh, so it did have that effect. Uh, the Canadians, I guess, were like, what is this all about? Sorry, what's this all about? And they just started their own country. Go figure. But this uh, obelisk was actually started and built to funnel that money into the, uh, that invasion. So this obelisk is pretty much the equivalent of, you know, today's, you know, condo on Billionaire's Row. You know, you just spend all that money to, to basically launder money. Uh, now, William McNevin was actually responsible for the obelisk on the other side of this church for Thomas Addis Emmett, who was the brother of Robert Emmett, who was a very famous revolutionary in Ireland. Remember, the Irish were fighting for their independence from Britain for a long time. It wasn't until the 1920s that they finally got their, uh, you know, independent Irish state. Uh, so, you know, they were basically colonized. And a lot of these people, like, like Thomas Addis Emmett, were exiled because they were fighting for their independence. And he came here, you know, he became the New York Attorney General, did a lot of cool stuff and really embraced New York City as his home, as a lot of people do in some way are exiled from their cities, states or countries and they come here to New York, pretty cool. Uh, so his obelisk is over on the other side. Hmm? He was actually a member of the United Irishmen who fought for uh, independence from Britain for a long time in the 1790s is when he was a part of it. Uh, and so this is interesting. You see these people, these are very distinguished, educated Irish people who came over here as well, and they came over before the famine. So, you know, you guys were always like, oh, who's a famous Irish person? I guess, when did Liam Neeson come over? Did he come over because of the famine? Now you got a couple people who are interesting, uh, interesting figures. That's pretty much it, William McNevin. Money laundering, famous Irish, well, not, fam not that famous, but interesting and important and accomplished Irish immigrants as well, huh? I don't know, I'm not gonna ramble. We still got more to cover. Cameron, did you learn something just now? Uh, a lot about Canada, yeah. Yeah, isn't that crazy? That the, uh, there was actually an invasion of Canada by the Irish in the 17, I'm sorry, 1860s. It's kind of wild, you don't hear that, that history, but it's there. That's why you watch these. Ting! All right. Okay, so as the mid-1800s started to come around, you had more and more uh, Irish coming into New York. And at the time, they settled into a neighborhood that was already kind of here and already uh, notorious, and that is the Five Points. As you can see above me, I have a little sign called the Five Points. This is where the intersection that is known as the Five Points converged, I guess. You had Orange Street coming down here, then you had Cross Street coming through, intersecting and having Anthony coming in at one side, creating Five Points. Those streets are now worth Moscow and Baxter, which are all here now, and they commemorated with that thing. But this neighborhood was a real dump. All right, it was like three times the infant mortality rate of the rest of the uh, city. It was like having a third world country within the city. In fact, it became very famous in 1841 when uh, Charles Dickens, the young Charles Dickens, made a tour of the United States, and he mentioned this place specifically by name in his American Notes of 1841. He really trashed the place. Let's just say it wouldn't make a very good real estate listing. Hideous tenements that take their names from robbery and murder and all that is loathsome, drooping, and decayed is here. But you'll get your deposit when you move out and uh, you can use a guarantor. Give me a call if you have any questions. Yeah. Anyways, this neighborhood was a real, in fact, it became so famous after that that they used to pay police officers to give people tours. They'd call it slumming, huh? You pay a police officer, give you a tour of the neighborhood because you were too scared to take a tour on your own. Uh, that's one way to get good tips. I'm sure police officers are like, yeah, pay up, baby or else I'll tase you. Uh, in fact, the movie Gangs of New York, a lot of it, that Martin Scorsese movie, uh, took place here uh, in this neighborhood. And, uh, and John C. Riley was that police officer, a corrupt police officer who gave people tours around the neighborhood. Now keep in mind, by 1855, 98% of the laborers, the hard laborers in New York were immigrants, 98%. And 88% of those were Irish. So just to give you an idea of what's making up the city's laborers, the people who were building the, you know, the, the digging the ditches and building the buildings at that time were mostly Irish. And they congregated here because this was where the poor lived. In fact, you have here now Mulberry Bend, what was Mulberry Bend Park in 1897, today is Columbus Park, part of Chinatown. This is all where Chinatown begins. But this was where like the worst of it was. Also part of the culture was saloons. Saloon keepers were kind of what people aspired to be because remember, if you're living in a dumpy tenement, there's no space, people slept on the fire escapes in the summer because it got so hot, 
you escape that by going to the saloons. The guy who runs the saloon is like the cool guy. He's the Mr. Popular, he's Mr. Connected. Uh, you know, it's kind of like your man caves. All you guys who are watching have your man caves, huh? It's kind of like your man caves, except a lot more tuberculosis. Uh, or maybe not, I don't know what you guys are doing on your free time. Keep in mind, this neighborhood, set, like 72% of it was foreign born of this neighborhood. That's a lot, man. I mean, think about this. Queens County is the most diverse county in the United States, and it's only half foreign born. So 72% foreign born in this neighborhood is uh, it's a big deal. So this was actually considered the first inner city slum in the history of the United States. Now keep in mind, back then, uh, the cities where the people worked and lived, but the poor didn't congregate and live there. They lived in like little shanties and stuff outside of the city limits. So this was one of the first inner city slums uh, in the history of the United States. And it was featured in Gangs of New York. And that persecution toward the Irish, like Gangs of New York, went on way too long. It was a long movie. We covered a lot there. Uh, what, do you, what do you say? Should we, should we keep it moving, Cameron? Let's keep the ball rolling. We're standing in front of a federal building. They're looking at me like I'm um, Timothy McVeigh or something. There's a 90s reference for you. <laughs> All right, let's keep it moving. All right, so as yet a lot of people coming here from Ireland, uh, different groups sprang up. Uh, to cater to these people, as I've kind of hit on so far, but I'll talk about more as we go. I'm actually in front of what's called the Watson House. Now, this house was actually built in 1793, which uh, classifies it officially in the city records as old as uh, It was actually added onto in 1806. In fact, one of the architects from the city hall, John McComb Jr., helped add it on. Uh, but it was built for this guy, James Watson, go figure. In 1885, this was actually made into Our Lady of the Rosary, which was kind of a mission that was meant to uh, basically welcome uh, uh, Irish women. A lot of Irish women came over, single women. Uh, you hear that, Cameron? Single ladies, huh? All right, anyways, they'd come over here and they needed a place to crash, they needed a place to stay. Uh, remember, people were trying to take advantage of uh, immigrants all the time, so this is a place where they would be able to land. Also, too, little aside, to the next thing is actually a shrine to uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton, by the way, who is the first American-born canonized saint. Uh, so I'm um, here's to hoping I, I make that list, right? All right. Also, the Irish women uh, were very employed out of poverty. It wasn't, it wasn't like a female empowerment movement or anything. They had to get any money because everyone was broke. So they were working very hard. And uh, this was before women were entering the workforce in big numbers. So they were kind of at the forefront of that. That's an important thing. That's, a, I guess, silver lining to that, to having to work to feed your family, but you wouldn't even know it. Seeing this house, you know, right here in front of the Staten Island Ferry. Let's keep it moving. And I realize that my shirt's, uh, you know, I'm unzipped here, and you're like, oh, zip up your shirt if you're cold. Well, continuity, baby. All right. So uh, when you have a big group of immigrants coming into a city like you did here in New York with the Irish, things are going to change because of it. One of the things that changed here was politics, baby. The Irish came in here and they became politically active. This is not unlike the other group that was coming in around the mid-1800s, which was the uh, Germans. They weren't not as politically active here in New York. Uh, it's a good thing that the Germans never became politically active ever in history. <laughs> Dear God. But anyways, the Irish did get uh, active, and one of the things they did was they gravitated towards the Democratic Party here, because the Democratic Party tended to be more pro-immigrant, and they also tended to, uh, to be opposed to anything restricting the ability of people to drink. Uh, I know, that sounds like a stereotype or something, but it's true. And behind me is actually the Tweed Courthouse. Now, the Tweed Courthouse is named after William Boss Tweed, one of the most famous corrupt bastards to ever live in New York City. And he was the head of Tammany Hall, which was a group like this political organization started in the late 1700s, but by the mid 1800s became a political machine, meaning that it helped get candidates elected. What it did was it basically did favors and helped out the Irish who came here find jobs, find places to live, get them turkeys during Thanksgiving and Christmas. Here's your turkey. Now just vote for whoever we want you to. Sometimes more than once, you know, vote early, vote often. That's what you do here in New York. Uh, so so they, they would vote for their candidate, and then in return, those candidates who got elected would give them money and give them contracts. How crazy. So to give you an idea, this, this was named after William Boss Tweed, who charged a lot of money to build this thing, a lot of overcharging. 
Uh, in fact, to give you an idea, this, this cost over $13 million to build. And uh, this is around the time, 1860s, 1870s, when the United States bought Alaska from the Russians for $7.2 million. This costs almost twice as much as it cost to buy Alaska from the Russians. Go figure. I know $7.2 million, you're thinking, wow, that's quite a deal. You can't even get a three-bedroom in Greenwich Village for that these days. But back then, that was a lot of money. Samuel Tilden actually prosecuted uh, William Boss Tweed uh, for his crimes of corruption and stuff based on the records for building this courthouse, his own courthouse. And to add more irony to this, they actually tried him and convicted him in his own courthouse. That's pretty cool, man. I know that if I ever go down, I want to go down getting, uh, you know, convicted in my own courthouse, you know? Yeah, it's pretty cool, you know? Now, the significance of all this is that the Irish were really one of the first major voting blocks uh, in the history of uh, New York politics and American politics for that matter, because they came here as a whole Irish group and they voted a certain way. Now, this is at a time in the like, 1820s, for example, uh, before the famine and all that stuff, that the elites controlled politics. The elites kind of chose who got elected, who got chosen, who got appointed, etc. But once this massive group of people starts coming in, they kind of shift that power. Not for nothing, I'm going to show you the next spot. Maybe we should turn here. Huh? Can we turn? Cameron, oh, oh, look at that, right in front. There's this building right over there. That right there is the Emigrant Industrial Savings Bank. This was started in 1850, actually by a guy named uh, Archbishop John Hughes. He was very active here in, uh, in, he helped found Fordham University, but he also helped build this. He was actually Irish himself. And he started this, helped start this bank because the Irish were getting uh, taken advantage of. Because they came over in the mid-1800s desperate and poor, even before then, a lot of them were illiterate. Uh, once again, this contrast with the Germans, I told you, they, who came over a little more educated, etc. But also, uh, this also kind of changed the way they were appealed to and, and written to in the news and in the, in the media. For example, cartoons were also very popular with, with getting points across and all that for that reason. Uh, ironically, Thomas Nast, uh, who, helped down, who helped bring uh, Boss Tweed down through his cartoons depicting him as a crook, etc., and who also uh, basically made popular uh, Santa, Santa Claus. He, he drew Santa Claus a big fat red red clothes and big beard and stuff. Sorry, uh, uh, weight weight challenged. Sorry, I don't want to get don't want to get canceled. You guys are gonna blog about me. Tom's calling uh, Santa fat. What's wrong with him? Anyways, ironically, Thomas Nast uh, used to draw Irish people as monkeys. He would draw them as monkeys or apes with like the knuckles dragging and everything because he thought they were, you know, uh, uneducated and dirty and criminal, etc. So it's interesting, they were very discriminated against and part of it was for the circumstances they get brought into the country uh, at the time. Oh, this doesn't sound familiar at all, does it? Good Lord, history repeats itself every time, man. People, people come in under desperate circumstances, a lot of times circumstances that are, that are kind of the fault of the United States, come here and then they get discriminated against here because they're, they're, in, uh, they're in harder times. So it's funny how that happens. But it's interesting too because people always ask, oh, well, is there an Ireland, a little Ireland today or an Irish town today in New York? It doesn't work that way. One of the reasons why so many Irish came in here and they settled in places like Five Points is because there were so many and the neighborhood became Irish because of the circumstances. It didn't just come out of nowhere. This isn't Disney World. You don't look at a map and say, oh, look, you get to Little Ireland by taking a right at Tomorrowland and then a left at Adventure Cove or whatever the hell and then there's Little Ireland. It's not like that. Well, my point being is there aren't a huge wave of Irish coming here anymore. There are neighborhoods that are Irish. For example, there is like a little, little Ireland kind of up in Woodlawn in the Bronx. There have been other Irish neighborhoods aside from the Five Points, like, uh, you know, Hell's Kitchen was very Irish uh, with the Westies, the famous, uh, you know, mob and gang that used to run that area. You had Woodside, Queens, other parts of, of the na of neighborhoods here that the Irish moved on to from places like the Five Points as they got their foothold in the United States. Whew, we covered a lot there, man. Cameron, how are you feeling? Proud of my Irish heritage. Yeah, you're, you're, uh, you're an Irishman. Fighting Irish. Eh? All right, sorry, that was a terrible accent. All right, let's keep this moving. <laughs> uh, look at that. It rained a little bit today.
anyways, guys, we made it to the end, baby. What a journey. We learned a lot about the Irish. We learned a lot about how they were coming in around the Revolutionary War, a little bit after, but really blew up after the War of 1812 and started to even blow up even more in the mid-1800s with the Potato Famine. We talked about that. We talked about the organizations that popped up to help these Irish come here. We talked about where they arrived. We talked about the politics associated with it. We got through a lot. Guys, if you enjoyed it, give it a little like, a little thumbs up, huh? Subscribe, huh? How about that? And, uh, you know, also check out the Patreon. That's how uh, we fund these things. That's actually where the idea for this video came from. A patron who I uh, gave a tour to back in the day. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. What else to tell you? Cameron, did you learn something about your heritage? Never been more proud. I know. I can see it. You know, I can see that tear in your eye. You've been crying this whole time. You cry, baby? Sorry. <laughs> Nothing wrong with crying every now and then. Believe me. Okay, uh, anyways, guys, thanks for watching uh, the video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I got to get out of here. Got to go, uh, got to go get the look of the Irish. Huh? Hey. Eh? All right. See y'all later. Sick.